Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad to see um, everybody showing up here. We are going to begin the webinar here in just a couple of minutes. We're going to see, um, give them a couple of minutes for late attendees to come in, give us about two minutes, and we will begin. All right, without further ado, let us begin. First off, welcome everybody. Uh, Dan, how are you today? John, I'm doing well, and yourself? Doing all right, doing all right. So uh, this is episode number three of Back to School webinars. We're gonna be talking about trade management today. As always, we do have to introduce ourselves my name is John Hoagland, Senior Performance Coach here at Top Step. 38 years of futures industry experience, not necessarily all of them trading. It's quite a journey. Started on the floor uh, as a runner and worked my way up. I did trade on the floor of the Mercantile Exchange for well over 20 years, migrating to screen trading in 2009. Took some time to unlearn some of the things I was using in the pit and relearn some of the things that I was going to be using on screen to begin to trade. Um, I've got a long history in trading. I have a, my father was on the floor of the Board of Trade for 45 years. I had a brother who was in the, um, the uh, S&P in the lumber pit for a few years. Uh, and then I've the, I have the remaining legacy <laughs> in our family here in the futures industry. So uh, since about 2011, it has been my great pleasure to uh, work with talk to and hopefully help the performance of thousands of traders and hopefully today we are going to have some good information and some good ideas on how to improve your performance now to my good friend dan hey john thanks very much hello everybody first off i already see a couple questions in here i just want to touch on that really quick just about is the course being recorded missed the last one yes these are recorded uh, we get them up on our YouTube page um, about the next day, give or take. So this should be up on YouTube either tomorrow or Friday. And we also have the last two up on our YouTube page. You can find those in the, the most recent videos there. So I just want to answer that one really quick. Um, my my name is Dan Hodgman. <clears throat> I'm one of the performance coaches here as well at Top Sip Trader. Um, I grew up in the industry just like John. Uh, family were traders from going back to my grandfather, my father, uncles. Uh, spent a lot of, grew up on the floor. I traded in the 30 year bond option pit. Um, and then as I got a little bit more into this and I started to really enjoy this, I, my my mentor, AKA my father basically looked at me and said, the pits are not where you wanna be. We gotta get you more towards the screen. So I kind of migrated towards the screen then. Started trading in uh, treasury yield spreads. I worked with a team of natural gas traders as well as some uh, Texas oil traders. And uh, that's kind of where my, experience began. Um, then I kind of went and served for the United States Marine Corps for four years while also maintaining my own futures account that I opened up when I was about 17 years old. Um, so I've been active at this for about half my life at this point, and uh, I don't see that changing for quite some time. And just like John, I am the last one in my family still doing this. Everyone else has retired and 
parted ways from the trading world. No fair. You added that you're uh, that you're on the uh, the the uh, regular on the market recap. I got to put that on my intro that I do the forecast every morning. Oh yeah, I, I didn't even put that on there. Someone else did that one for me. Yes, I did the regular on the the market recap every day. I'm one of the co-hosts of our podcast, Limit Up. <laughs> Yes. Well, I'm going to have to add to that. At least somebody's looking out for you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to start these with a dad wisdom, and I think this one fits perfectly. That's a picture of my dad in about 1960 on the Chicago Board of Trade floor. He was the hedge manager for Ralston Purina, and at that time, they were the creators of Chex Cereals. They sent a bunch of cases down there uh, to the floor so that he and my dad could pass them out to all his buddies it's just a good picture of the handsome man and he had lots of great wisdoms when it came to trading one of my favorites is if the market is going with you you'll never have enough on and if the market's going against you you'll always have too many on i think very apropos for today's subject of risk management or i should say trade management that's a spot on um, quote right there how about it, right? Uh, trade management could be identified or or defined as a, a everything a trader actively does after a trade is executed to maximize the potential profit and minimize the risk. There are tons of ways to to manage trades from following it on charts to specific tools to use to even waiting for the stars to align there's a bunch of ways this these are just some of the ways that we've seen people try in our in, in, in our experience the things that may have or may have not worked for us uh, we didn't put the uh, disclaimer on here, but that's okay because we're not going to be talking about buying or selling of any particular products here, are we, Dan? I don't think so. All right. So I will say, looking back, you should have shorted equity markets all day long. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Absolutely. <laughs> it wouldn't have been too much to manage that. Just sit on your hands. I was going to say, just sit back and let it happen. Absolutely. So a wise man once told us, we don't get any smarter once we put the trade on. Trade management, to me, and in my, and I'm in my experience, and I'm pretty sure, Dan, in your experience, is an art form that few will ever really master. Um, having a strategy for trade management should be based on market state, which would be helpful. Range bound trades should probably have a specific target. When the when the market is range bound, you've got some probably pretty specific levels of resistance above and support below. Those should probably be your entries as well as your targets. But trending trades, similar to the equities today. If you had a specific target and you may have been cutting yourself short, okay, uh, in a, in a trade, but it was going to be a, a probably a better day to manage by trailing stops. Again, trade management is an art form few ever really master. Dan, what do you think? I couldn't agree more. Trade management is one of the most difficult things like John has in that quote. We don't get any smarter when we put that trade on. Like we said, I think last week when we were talking about risk management, one of the most important things when we're trading is making that decision making process before executing that trade, knowing where we're going to get out, knowing how we're going to let that trade play out, knowing all those things that we can control. We can control where we get in and we can control where we place our stops and profit targets. If we can focus on those things, it's going to help us within that trade management because as soon as that trade gets on, everything gets really difficult. All right. So, Dan, I know this is um, one of the most popular questions that you get because it's one of the most popular questions I get mm -hmm. from traders. 
why when I move my stop to break even plus one, does my stop seem to always get filled? So we have our little chart here. We have a support level here. Uh, we've got a little buy order sitting right here. Our buy order gets filled. Our initial stop level is down here. It's very tempting to remove the risk on a trade relatively quickly. And this is one of the things, again, that we hear the most. If I've moved my stop to break even or break even plus one, the market may come back and retest my support level or my buy, my buy level. And if I've moved my stop up, I'm going to get taken out of that trade. And then I'm just going to have to sit and watch the trade play without me unless I'm going to fall into chasing the trade. And we don't, we don't want to be doing that. So that it's a extremely important to make sure that your level has been tested and retested and the market goes in your direction before moving your stop to remove the risk on the trade. I don't know how many times people come to me and say, oh, every time I move my stop up to break even, it seems to get taken out and then I miss the move. What do I do? Don't move it. <laughs> it's still a valid trade until it proves invalid. If we had our stop below our sport, support level, we didn't even truly check our support level. We got in, we were able to hold that trade if we left our stop right at the beginning. And instead of waiting for the market to continue to move our way before removing the risk on it, we're already out of the trade. Dan, what percentage of trades or traders do you think have come to us and said this is an issue for them? I would have to say at least 75%. I had this conversation yesterday, as a matter of fact. I think I spent about 45 minutes on the phone with a trader talking about this exact thing. And I just kept saying, if you chose to enter at that level the first time, the next time it comes to that level and nothing has changed, what is the thought process again? Well, you'd want to enter that buy once again. And instead of, instead we continue to see traders put that stop up at break even because it started to maybe go in their favor just a little bit. We bring that stop up. It's still a valid entry point in this case for the long. It's still a valid entry point for the long there. As soon as you, get stopped out at break even. Everything goes out the window because no longer to you is that trade a valid trade when in all actuality, yes, it's still a very valid trade. And that's where I think people start to struggle and question themselves and question their strategy is because they are bringing these stops to break even. They get stopped out and then to them, that was a loss of a trade or a poor trade and therefore I should not execute on that anymore when in all actuality that was still a great trade and things set up and played out just as expected. Now, I understand why people do this and I even find the urge to do it myself from time to time, but I try and resist that urge. Nobody likes to take a loss, man. The market starts heading our way into trade. The first thing that everybody I think wants to wants to do or tries to do is to eliminate eliminate the risk on the trade. But it doesn't help when you have a good support level or a good resistance level. If you get if you if you manage that trade by moving that stop up too quickly. And I think that's one of the biggest problems in trade management is People are first so eager to remove the risk on the trade to begin with. Without a doubt. And something that I know well, we want to take that risk off the table. And so that first initial instinct is to bring that stop to break even. That still leaves risk on the table because at that point we are still paying commissions. We're paying the fees to execute those trades. When in all actuality, if we stay in that trade and let's say this market continues in a direction and this kind of touches on one of the questions I saw earlier, um, letting that winner run, then you can start to bring those stops up. But you put those stops where there's those points of invalidation. The market has made a new high, give, come back a little bit and continue to that to create that rally there. Then you can start to place those stops 
in locations that you're going to lock in good profits, but you're also now allowing that winner to run. Which is exactly what our next slide is about. Oh, that, not that one. Many, many traders choose the, the just below the previous bar technique or just plain follow price too closely with their stops. And, you know, if we had an execution for a long down here and we were looking for continuation to the upside in a one time frame activity in this time frame, we're probably going to be moving our stop below the previous bar. So on this, well, we're going to get stopped out on the previous bar. Uh, here, up here, oh, we're going to get stopped out on this bar. Here, we're going to get stopped out on this bar. We're going to get stopped out here on this bar as well. Even though the market is continuing to move higher and higher, this is one of the things that I think um, retail fear-based traders, and I think it's one of the reasons why we tend to move our stops too close and we tend to move our stops where our where our real competitors are, our short time frame pea shooters like me and like you, we're always trying to be to be cute and put our stops, and we tend to do that all in the same place. So following the the low of the previous bar may not necessarily be the best technique for you to bring to to stay in a in a trade that is moving in this direction. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven opportunities for the market to come back and check our our stop which generally we we tend to move too close we tend to follow way too close with the trades is this one of the techniques you were talking about dan yes i think i yeah that's exactly what i was talking about finding ways and locations to place those stops when i look at this chart here i'm looking to place that stop at those levels where that consolidation started to create i'm not going to move the stop until it breaks out above that once it starts to break out above that we can then bring that stop below that consolidation area because hey we can look at it and say one i like the profit up here i'm going to be very content taking that two everybody says let those winners run so at this point i can let that winner run and if it goes in my favor I'm going to do okay. I'll wait for that next point of consolidation to start to bring my stop up again. But I think a lot of times when we start, when you hear a lot of traders talking about just below the previous bar, it depends. You have to think about the time frame you're looking at. If you're looking at too small a time frame, this mark, these markets are designed to chop people up. They're designed to, as I've always been told, the term I was taught as a right when i got into this was every market has that heartbeat um if that heartbeat starts to fluctuate you want to give it some room to move so don't bring that stop up too quick let that market make that next move to the next level or that next area consolidation above we can bring that stop up and then look for that next and then let it continue to go but it is so hard and I know everybody will agree if you're if you're long down here to see this pullback and to withstand this pullback, which basically creates the balance area, Dan, that you're talking about. Once this area of balance is established, you move your stop below that area of balance, and which would have kept you in this continuation to the upside. Yes. Yeah, it's difficult. It is super difficult when you see that pullback there, but if you go back to why you got in that trade and you said, look, I'm looking for this market to make a bigger directional move. I have my stop. I'm still content with the location of my stop. My entry point is still a valid point. Let's hope this thing continues. Now, there are tools that you can use that will help you stay in winning trades the parabolic stop and reverse in the right time frame can be a useful assist now what i mean in the right time frame is you may take this trade in a longer or a shorter time frame 
the bigger the time frame you do, the longer time frame you look at to take your trades, the further away this parabolic stop and reverse is going to be. In this particular case, if you took this long, let's just call it here, okay? For example, the parabolic stop and reverse gives you a mathematical level on each bar with which to follow your stop with. Almost got taken out right here. Almost doesn't matter, but this, this is keeping us, look how far away from price this parabolic sar is keeping us until we get to this consolidation almost gets us taken out here and then continues to, to keep us in this trade all the way to here so parabolic stop and reverse is something that you may need to change your time frame um you know if you, if you took this let's call this a if you took this on a 30 minute chart the 30 minute chart is going to be showing you your parabolic stop and reverse all the way down here. If you shorten up, you go to a 15 or a 10 minute, you may find that you can see that the parabolic stop and reverse was able to keep you in this trade almost, almost to the high, okay? So this is something that you, you wanna take a look at, you wanna look back. Anytime you wanna learn something, in trading, look back, add the parabolic stop and reverse. Take a look at some of the trades you've made. Take a look at how you've managed some of those trades and then add the parabolic stop and reverse on it. See if there's a time frame with that stop and reverse that would have helped you stay in that trade longer. This was a hard spot. If I'm short, if I'm long down here, I'm really starting to sweat when I see this pullback. But the stop and reverse basically kept me profitable at this level, almost. Well, yeah, definitely profitable. But did not take me out of a position that ended up paying me a lot more. So think about looking at the parabolic SAR stop and reverse for your um, for a possible helpful tool in trade management. Again. If you're taking a trade off a, off an hourly chart, your stop and reverse is going to be way far away. Shorten up the time frame and see if you can get stay in that trade for a longer period of time. And again, take a look back. Add the parabolic stop and reverse. Check the different time frames and check levels that you have taken trades. See how far the parabolic stop and reverse may have kept you in that trade. I would imagine a lot of folks got freaked out or thought they were gonna lose all their all the profit they had when this pullback came in, but the parabolic stop and reverse would have kept us in all the way to near the high of this entire move. John, that's a great indicator to point out. And I just wanna add, just if you're going to be using any sort of indicators such as the parabolic SAR, be consistent in how you use it. Um, don't fluctuate because one creates validation for you and one says, hey, get the heck out of this trade. Um, be consistent in the view and the lens that you use to look at these types of indicators. Yeah, the stronger the directional move, the shorter time frame parabolic SAR you're going to be able to stay in the trade with. But Dan's right. Take a look at what makes you comfortable as far as the as far as the risk with this parabolic stop and reverse, um, and try and use it consistently. But again, a lot of uh, a lot of it is the is the um, the strength of the directional move. If it's a real strong move, even a shorter time frame parabolic stop and reverse will keep you in it. One of the one of the many caveats and and challenges we have as traders is to make sure we're looking at the right the right time frame for the current situation so just like over trading trade management is largely overdone over managing trades can be just as much can can be just as much of a harm to a successful trading plan as it can be 
helpful depends largely on this on your plan and your your system of managing trades if you have a plan for your trade and it plays out in your favor let it breathe most of the time over managing trades is probably not going to help you Go back be, to that quote you had uh, earlier, John. Um, what exactly did you say there? We don't get any smarter once we put that trade on. Right. Yep. And you know, it's a it's a thin line because you you want to be paying attention for for you know bigger changes in the in the market state while you're in a trade. But it's so difficult to distinguish what is truly a bigger market state change and what is just a common pullback in your, you know, against you. So, but again, most of the time, if you have a plan for the trade, let the plan play out. We again don't get smarter once we have the trade on. <laughs> um, my suggestion is, and and I've used this with with a lot of folks is. Don't be a, a, a Lenny. If you've ever read a book called Of Mice and Men, Lenny is a character in there who's who loves little furry animals, and he he just he means them no harm, but he picks them up and he read he pets them and loves them and keeps them in his pocket and loves them so much that he ends up killing them. And I think that a lot of traders um, that are you know trying to manage trades tend to do that we tend to love the trade too much we tend to want to get the most out of it and in doing so we create the opposite of what we are trying to accomplish so moving stops strategically with tools or technical analysis and think about what your fear based competition is doing and think about doing something different because you know most of them are, are going to be wrong Hence, going back to the example of moving my stop just below the previous bar, a lot of of fear-based traders do that. They want to they want to capture as much of the trade as they can, and in over managing the trade, they, they take themselves out of trades that could be worth a lot more. And you know, there's there's nothing that is 100% right in trade management. There's nothing that is. 100% wrong in trade management. It's it's purely subjective and in the moment. But if you have a system that that uh, you know that that you can use consistently, I think you'll find that you're going to become a better risk management by letting trades have a little bit more room. So. One of the other, there's a couple other features of trade management that we wanted to touch on today. And one of them is trade sizing. Um, trade sizing is directly related to your risk appetite and the, and the risk appetite in your trading plan. If your trading plan is that, you know, each trade that you take can have a maximum of $400 of risk for each trade. Now, I would tell people all the time, don't be placing stops financially, be placing stops technically for reasons of invalidation for the trade technically. But if you have a, you know, your max risk on any given trade is $400 and you're looking at a trade that is only risking $100 per contract, not again, because that's all we want to risk, but that's the distance to our point of invalidation you may be able to trade four contracts on that trade because your max risk per trade is 400 your total risk on that trade would be 400 does that make sense dan yeah john i love what you put here i think i think very often the rhetoric comes across as trade one lots Manage your risk with that one contract. But if you see a trade that the risk per contract in that trade is $100 and you're comfortable putting up a risk of $400, you can look at this and say, the risk is so age symmetric here. It's giving me such a great opportunity. I can actually leverage up here. And if I'm wrong, I'm still okay. And I, that's what I really like about this here. 
is you bring that in, and this gives that chance saying, look, yes, we totally get one lots is the most risk management way to trade, but sometimes we want to leverage up, and these are the times that we can start to consider <laughs> leveraging up so long as we have a good recent track record. We are growing that account balance. We've had a good run over the most recent period of time, maybe the last two weeks. We've been pretty successful. We're in that high 70% win rate. Things are looking really good. If you can kind of check those boxes when you have that cheap risk to get in the trade that you're saying my technical stop is only $100 away per contract, I'm very comfortable risking $400 per trade. It gives you that opportunity to size up, and that's what's so great. Yeah, because your you know your mass risk per trade doesn't increase because of the, the number of contracts you're executing, and if the trade plays your way, you're sitting pretty with four contracts on. Exactly it goes to the dad wisdom. You've managed yeah. your risk, so if the market goes against you, hey, you didn't have too much on. You knew right. going into that trade, you were willing to risk four hundred, but if it goes in your favor. You've got a lot on and you're sitting pretty. <laughs> I love it when a plan works out that way. The next thing we wanted to kind of discuss is scaling into positions. Some people call it averaging down, adding to losing trades to average, to lower your average entry is inevitably going to end up being fatal at some point you liked it at eight you add more at six you add more at four you're worried at two and you're puking out of everything at at, at zero or at even we used to call this the moron trade <laughs> if the market's going against you you put more on so um Adding to, to losing positions to lower your average entry again is inevitably fatal. I saw a lot of a lot of traders that were doing this uh, eventually getting removed from the trading floor. There is a difference, however, with choosing to accumulate an inventory in a specific price range. It is acceptable only when risk is established and abided by. You cannot, you cannot add, you can't accumulate an inventory in a specific price range and then waffle when price gets to your stop. You take that stop. Absolutely. This goes to that chart John was showing earlier when we were talking about people getting out at break even. A lot of times what you'll see is traders like that level a lot. And as it continues to come back in, come back into play, that's where they can look at it and say, hey, here's an opportunity. Instead of getting out of this trade, I still like that this, I still like this location. I still like this average or this um, uh, price range here. I'm going to go ahead and here's my chance to leverage into that, add another contract while maintaining where my stop is, so long as I've accepted that risk. And as John says here, it's abided by. If you abide by that risk, you can add into that trade. And that's one of those opportunities where you can look at it and you can say, hey, this is still a very valid entry point. At this point, I'm going to leverage up. I'm going to take a little bit more risk because I'm trading another contract. But if you hold where your stops are supposed to be placed and you sit in that trade, you accept that loss and walk away. Excellent. What about scaling out of positions? A lot of traders, they'll put a few on, and as soon as the market starts going their way, they'll start peeling off some of those profits, some of those contracts in profit. But I think most of the time, traders tend to scale out too quickly. And this is a very simple explanation of why I think that. First of all, I think that the first exit should cover all of the cost if the trade were to go to a full stop out. And again, there's a very simple example of that. If we're going to execute a two lot position and we have 20 ticks of total risk, that's 10 contracts, 10 ticks per contract. If I can hold in and get out of my first contract at 
the total risk, which is basically two to one reward over risk per contract, I've paid for the entire risk of the trade on the first exit. Then I can then I can continue to manage the second contract because now I have a truly free trade. If I get out of this first contract at 10 ticks, I'm only I'm only alleviating half of the total risk. Market could turn around and head back to 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 to, to a full stop out. It doesn't mean that the market can't go up to 19 ticks of profit and go back and, and hit a full stop out. But if I'm going to be consistent in this, and I'm maybe even I'm only right half the time, it's the reward over risk that's going to keep me profitable, and it's going to also have me have the 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 fortitude, intestinal fortitude, to hold on to that second contract for maybe a much bigger contract for a much bigger profit. Dan, I don't know how many times you have people saying, I want to, I want to, I want to trade two contracts because I want to leave that runner on there. But again, if you get out of the first contract too early, you're skewing your reward over risk ratio. And over time, that may be enough to keep you from maintaining profitability when you're scaling out of positions. What are your thoughts on that, Dan? Absolutely, John. And I'll just give my personal, the way I, I go about this for my own trading. I have a really, really hard time allowing a runner to run. Um, it's something I've really struggled with. I have maintained a mentality of if I'm looking for that bigger opportunity, my that trade, I don't really scale out of them. I tend to take it all in and all out together. I have a really personally a really difficult time watching a runner run because to me, that's when I really struggle with my, my execution. Um, so I am all in, all out on nine, probably 92% of my trades, all in, all out. And uh, if I'm looking for that bigger opportunity, I'm going to downsize the size that I'm trading and I will let them play out over time. Um, but sometimes for me, I really have a very difficult time letting those runners just go. Uh, I'm the same way. Seems like when I try and do that, it just ends up costing me. I'm more of an all in, all out kind of guy as well which is just another form of trade management. Yep. We have to, and I think the biggest thing when it comes to this type of stuff, whether it's trade management, risk management, entry, exit, anything of that nature, we have to kind of, there's a saying in the Marine Corps, um, there are 14 leadership traits and um, or leadership principles. And one of them is know yourself and seek self-improvement. And I think with trading, it aligns very well with that. We have to understand ourselves before we can start making all these decisions in our trading. If we know ourselves as a trader, then we know how we can trade around that. If we are trading based off of something we learned in chat rooms or something we saw on the internet without understanding ourselves, we're really going to struggle. So if once you understand yourself, like John and I both just said, we have a hard time with the runner. We just have to be all in and all out majority of the time. That's just how we are. And some people can execute and let those runners go for hours, days, weeks, whatever the case may be. Um, and other traders, for them, that doesn't work. And um, you just have to understand yourself. And I think that's the most important thing. Thanks, Dan. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Yep. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and, and move on to the question and answer section here. Um, this is an opportunity for you uh, to get 25% off your first trading combine. Market 25 is the uh, the uh, uh, promo code for that. And uh, you can uh, you take advantage of this if this, again, is your first trading combine on or before September 30th. We'll look forward to seeing you with us and and hopefully seeing your success. So, Dan, uh, should we start at the top? I say we go right from the top. All right. Yeah. Uh, level two is saying, wow, what a day. Uh, thank you, Ben. Ben saying, just watch the recording of the last webinar. Very informative. Good. We hope that they all are. Uh, how do I force myself uh, to let winners play in, in my direction? This is Love Genie. Uh, what do you think, Dan? 
Well, I think we've touched on that one pretty good so far, but John and I both just said we are all in, all out, letting those letting those runners go. That's really difficult. So here's my advice. Go back to that risk management that we talked about last week. If you haven't checked it out, make sure you check out that um, that webinar there. We talked about before you get in that trade, knowing where you're out, knowing where your stop is and where your profit target is. If you have a hard time staying in those trades, if you're one of those people that likes to bring that stop to break even the second it starts to go in your favor, piece of advice I would have, have a distraction. Step away, go make a quick sandwich. Play phone games, play Candy Crush, put Netflix on, something to help kind of create that distraction so you're not going back to being a Lenny over <laughs> over loving the trade that you're in step mm. away for a little bit and work on the discipline of allowing your stops and profit targets to execute yeah sometimes uh well one of the trading psychologists that we recently had uh uh with us told me a few years ago sometimes you're just going to have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's a difficult thing to try and do to force yourself to do that. But if you're finding bigger opportunities, um, part of that is is an accounting of how much the trades you're already out of continue in your direction, how often they do that. Uh, but it's, you know, everything is a Part of the journey of Jenny here in in trading, if it's a, if it's something that you want to become better at, it's practice. You're going to find that if you let your winners play in your direction from time to time, you're going to get a good one, and it's going to help you hopefully be more comfortable the next time you see that same situation. Level two says he needs to listen to his gut. It's my uh, favorite indicator. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Nick Mo, is there a, any shoulder to cry on for me, please? I put on a 6K winner on my demo account instead of my pro account. Oh, um, Nick. I hate it when that happens. Oh, yeah. But hey, at least there's lesson to be learned, understanding why you entered in that trade, what worked in that trade, and uh, so that the next time you have that opportunity, you'll be able to capitalize on it. We feel you, Nick. Will you feel you? <laughs> uh, Landon says we're cracking them up with the quotes today. I uh, had a level set on my live account and traded in the middle of nowhere on my combine, paid the price. Hog, any advice on avoiding trading on tilt? Level two, first thing is recognizing you're on tilt. Just having that feeling inside of you, that that venom or that discomfort or whatever it is that's telling you, all right, I'm probably not going to be making good trading decisions. Then it's the then it's the hard part. Recognizing it is the easy part. Walking away with that little voice in your head still saying, yeah, but what if? But what if? That's the hard part. Um, you know, where is where is your your tilt level level two? Is it a specific or zone typed? Um, level of losses. Maybe it's a, consecu a consecutive losing trade that flips your switch. I've gotten on tilt actually up money before because I had a couple three losses in a row and that's put me on tilt. So start thinking about and accounting for where your where your triggers are. Where is you where does your switch flip? Is it money? Is it consecutive losses? You might find it a little interesting, especially you know when you find yourself getting on tilt when you're up money. I think that's where I found myself on tilt more than anything. Up money. Down money, I know what I can control. My plan, I have a plan around how to stop losing money. When I go up money, that's when the plan, the plan doesn't always say exactly what to do when you're having a really good day. You feel really good about everything you're doing. And then things start to go hayward. And that's where we start. I find myself struggling. Um, the down days, I can control those. I know where my stops are. I know where I'm getting out. I know my limits. When I start going up money, that's where things for me, I definitely do uh, find myself getting into some uncomfortable territories. And that's why I find the 
percentage rules. If I'm up a certain amount of money, never giving back more than 30% of that. Maybe as I get bigger and bigger, that percentage goes lower and lower. Yeah, sometimes just taking that first loss off off the high watermark of the of the trading session, if you're up money, that can do it. So yep. get, get used to just being able to step away. It'll actually, even though it hurts at the time, it should help um, improve your uh, maintenance of mental capital, not to mention real capital. Uh, Paul White saying, sometimes patience is knowing that you should expect that retest and enter upon market confirmation. I think um, Paul's talking about our example of uh, the market coming back and rechecking previous areas. Absolutely. Uh, as an alternative to moving the stop limit uh, to break even, what about moving your stop limit to a Theo average after the first scale? Hey, there's a million ways to skin a cat, Andrew. I would love to know if that is something that is working for you. Mark, what if it goes in your favor by a substantial amount? Is it fair to move the stop then? Yes. Yeah, a substantial amount is a subjective lo level, but we're looking for, you know, a, a level that is, you know, perhaps beyond a, a short time frame resistance level. Let's say we're long, we're staying in it, we've gotten through a short time resistance level, uh, then I'm going to move my stop up. Yep. People get involved, maybe driven by fear of missing out always. Always one of the uh, one of the motivators of of sometimes not so advisable trading. Why is the trade still valid? Eunice is asking. Uh, it hasn't reached your point of invalidation yet. It's still above that support level. Um, you know, in that example, we were just using that example to just kind of show how the, how we might move a stop in that situation. But if, you know, you see a support level and you trade near that support level and price hasn't penetrated that support level, to me, that trade is still valid. Very few things are going to change the validation of that trade. Some Some crazy news coming out. If there's something major that will affect that whole entire market state. If that market is staying above where your stop is, it's still a valid execution and a valid trade. Uh, ben has a question here, buddy. Buddy, I guess he left. I think he was having trouble hearing. Oh, no, that's Dennis. Well, when you have a moment, could you let me know if closing partial positions is beneficial in the long run? Do you guys use that method? I think Ben may have left before we really got to the part where we were talking about scaling out. Um, you know, is it beneficial in the long run? I don't know. Does the market keep going in that direction? Right. Uh, you know, what is a good time frame to do that trade management with? A lot of the heartbeat. We don't know what your time frame is in in the the charts and the the trades that you're taking. It would be difficult for us to to come up with any recommendation on that, Mark Carruthers, and I, I apologize for that. Um, go ahead, Dan. I was just gonna say, as long as you're consistent with the lens you view that market, um, I will say, chances are, if you're looking at a one minute or a five minute chart, that heartbeat is gonna be kind of like uh, what Justin said here, it's gonna look more like a cardiac arrest. Um, but that's just kind of my personal opinion. I do recommend making sure you're looking at 1530 to an hourly time frame to slow that heartbeat down just a little bit. Thanks, Dan. John's asking what uh, time frame do you like trading off of, Dan? I focus on a 30 minute, one hour, four hour, and daily. I'm a daily, daily and a 30 and a market profile pretty much. That's just me. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, have you used the parabolic SAR in the in the 10-year note? If so, 
what time frame. Don't trade the 10 year note. Um, Dan, I know that you're, you're uh, a treasury guy, but I'm not sure that you've used that parabolic stop and reverse in the 10 year note. No, I can't say I have. Okay, so John, put it on. Ch check different time frames. Check if you see a, a market that's you know in in a pretty decent move, which time frame keeps you into it. Then remember that. And if you see a similar market situation where the market is directional and you're expecting it to be a, a powerful move, then think about going back to that parabolic SAR that time frame. Uh, the time frame for the parabolic, um, hang on one second, I can tell you. Okay, uh, the one that I tend to, to look at most, uh, it's a 0 0.02 step, max step 0.2. That's that's on the TS Trader platform, and that's the default parabolic SAR on the TS Trader platform. All right. Uh, uh, looks like we've got John Manning with a with a question or comment here. Hey, Dan and Hog, I used to use the lower time frames like the five. I have tried to transition into the 15 and 30 minute time frames to base my trades because of Hoog's advice, uh, which has absolutely increased my patience and trading overall. Um, other than candle reversal setups and volume and support and resistance, is there anything else I should be looking at um, that you would consider a mandatory indicator? Thanks, guys. Um, mandatory indicator. Boy, that's a, that's a tough one uh, because... There's no indicator that is that is going to be 100% helpful all the time. There's nothing. There's no indicator that's going to be um, that's that's always going to be wrong. There's no indicator that's always going to be right. Um, so I don't think that there's any mandatory indicator. It's what works for you, Dan. What do you think? I'm right there with you, John. Um, when it comes to the indicator world. I like to keep it as simple as possible. Um, you know, I for me, I have to have some sort of volume profile to be looking at just to help guide me and myself. Again, the other one I keep on there is I use a VWAP. I know I've said this before. I use a VWAP with one deviation off of it just for mere. I'm not using it as an indicator. I'm using it kind of help as a, some sort of self-control um, as a reminder when I look at the charts. Um, it helps me just kind of keep a guide of everything. So I don't think there's anything mandatory. I think like John said, it's really what you have found beneficial, what you have found comfortable to look at. And Joshua is asking, what about volatility? And I think he was asking that when we were talking about trade sizing, volatility is probably going to increase your risk. You're going to lower your contract size at that time. Absolutely. John was talking about uh, adding into losing positions, and apparently it didn't go well for him. Said he, uh, he got his his butt kicked doing that, and I can understand. Um, not saying I've never done it either. <laughs> <laughs> um, John Grinon is asking if you have a high probability trade, like a five tick target, what would you use as a stop loss in ticks? Uh, John, I haven't looked for a target less than less than. 15 or 30 ticks in two years, five years, something like that. You're a much shorter time frame trader than I am, so I can't really advise you on that. Same. I can't think of really any product that I'm going to be looking for. Even when I'm looking at the bonds, I'm not looking for anything smaller than a 10 tick target in the bonds. Uh, most of my small, small winners eventually turn into big losers. Justin, risk management. Risk management. Don't let those small winners turn into big losers. It's okay if they're small losers because you're going to have some big winners too. 
Uh, can you please give discount current for current combines? Well, I'm I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, where are we here? I got lost, Dan. We've got a question from uh, Bob Rutter. How did Dan have gotten funded in micros and even in graduating from the pro account to the premium funded account? <clears throat> I seem to be just fine trading micros. I trade the micro and Q, um, but I can't seem to find my way with the minis. I keep blowing up. I think it has to do with the fact that I can handle a lot more heat with the micros because of the low tick value. Any thoughts? Uh, Bob, great question. I think um, micros, definitely you can, can take a little bit of heat because the dollar value doesn't seem to be as large, um, especially when we start trading with uh, the minis. But um, at the end of the day, if the strategy works for one, in theory, it should work for the next. So it's obviously more of a psychological thing. The bigger question for me is how much heat are you willing to take in those micros are you taking, is your risk management still there? What we talked about last week. So are you still maintaining that similar risk management or are you letting these trades swing a lot longer? I think there's a lot that can be there um, to understand this. Um, so it's a tough question. Um, in theory, if it works in one, it should work in the next. Again, it has to do with what you're changing when you go from the micros to the minis. And a lot of it, like Dan said, is psychological. Your your micros are a tenth the risk. You know, it's easier to to manage that risk when it's not as threatening to you. Um, good to see you, by the way, Bob Rutter. I haven't talked to you in a, in a while. It's great to see you. And uh, yeah, it's you know, it's the heat that you can take in the minis with, because it's a tenth the size that may be making it easier now. Think about that, Bob. If you're able to take more heat in the micros, maybe if your trade location was closer to where your stops might be in the micros, you'd be a, perhaps a little more successful using the minis. There is a lesson to be learned here, Bob. Account for the amount of risk you're allowing on those micros trades and you know, if you're if you're finding that you're able to stay in those trades before reaching your stop, that might be an interesting opportunity for you to start looking to take trades in the min in the in the minis close to those micros stops. Just a thought. Account for it. Let us know how that works for you. Uh, Justin, can the ATR be helpful in determining good stops at supply and demand zone? Well, the ATR is, uh, is um, you know, probably a, a, a measure of volatility that I know a lot of folks look at. But I think that the ATR can probably be providing some pretty far away stops uh, when you're in an, a supply and demand zone. So, um, you know, I would look at it think about it but i'm not i can't say 100 percent um sure either way uh when i place felix when i place an order with a bracket on tst with two contracts they stop limit and tap take profit contain both contracts so i understand the scale out should be fully manual no, on TS Trader, you can put on two different contracts with two different profit targets. Um, I can maybe briefly show you how to maybe do that. Um, hang on one second. I'd like to be able to show you. Do we have time, Dan? If you have time, we've all got time, John. Okay, so here's a dome. Here we're gonna we're gonna look at the brackets. So I can use two contracts, and then I can also have target one, target two, target three. So I can put in three contracts, and then I can change my profit target and my 
and my uh, stop loss to different levels. So I'm going to go four, and I'm going to go and I'm going to go six. So my take profit is going to be at two for the first one, four for the second one, six for the for the for the third one. Okay, so I can even add more targets. Here's target one, target two, target three, target four, just by clicking on this. Hopefully that's going to help you. That was a pretty quick explanation. I hope that doesn't go too quick, but uh, where do we find the recordings for the last few webinars? I'd like to watch them again as a refresher, Daryl. They're going to be on, fa on our Facebook page. Um, what is it? Uh, Facebook, Top Step, Squawk Radio? Top uh, topsiptrader.com slash Facebook brings you right to our Facebook page. Ah, okay. All right, good. Um, and YouTube too, right? I think. Yes. Okay. Rob Thomas, Rob T, good to see you. Thanks, guys. Great info and in, in, in revision. I do move my stops too tight, so I will try parab parabolic SAR. I have to cut my number of trades down to eliminate... to eliminate over trading and also look for trades near points of invalidation and slowly, slowly building confidence. Good to, good to hear that, uh, Rob Thomas, and it's good to see you here. Uh, thoughts on setting um, auto break even, for example, even if the trade goes into your favor 15 points uh, instead of limiting out. Well, depending on what we're talking about, 15 points can be a considerable move. If it's in the S&Ps and I'm 15 points ahead, yeah, I'm gonna be probably pr pr protecting some of that risk. Um, yeah, there is a there is a point where you want to begin to protect protect some of the profit on a trade like that, without a doubt. All right, I think we've got a an hour here. We're trying to keep this at an hour. I think we should call it a day. What do you think, Dan? Absolutely. So for those of you that didn't get catch the whole thing or want to go back and listen to some of the uh, previous ones. Again, you can find those on our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in Top Step and uh, we should pop right up. They'll be right there on the homepage. Um, if not, they'll be right with the most recent videos. This one should be up um, by tomorrow afternoon or Friday morning. Um, so thank you for, for joining us today. Yes, thank you everybody for joining us. If you didn't get your question answered today, uh, we do apologize. You can always join the group coaching meeting at one o'clock on Wednesdays. We'll be happy to address any of the questions that didn't get answered. Uh, we'll see you on the market forecast. We'll see you on the market recap. We'll see you on the uh, coaches playbook and all the other stuff. Thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Dan, for joining me today. And, and Thank uh, you, John. Trade well, everyone.